Thanks, Mario. Those are really wonderful opening remarks. Um, I'll be heartfelt. You can decide whether I'm noble, uh, but uh, really it's a, it was a wonderful way to start off a day together here, um, and uh, nice to be back at CMS. Welcome to all of you here, and to all of you on, in TV land, I guess you're watching as well. We're getting used to these uh, hybrid uh, sessions, which is great. It really expands, uh, expands the discussion. Um, I want to talk generally about the international refugee regime, but then by the end tell you why we need a new regime, and it probably shouldn't be called the refugee regime. And then you can start throwing things at me. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of critiques of the international uh, refugee regime, from the fact that it's underfunded, asylum backlogs, protracted refugee situations where people stay refugees forever, the so-called non-entree policies of the global uh, north, unequal attention to crises. So, for example, we probably have two million people displaced now in Darfur, and it barely makes it into the, the newspapers these days, given what else is going on <clears throat> in the world. All these demand our attention. A lot of them will get attention uh, today. But I want to talk about two broader issues uh, in these brief remarks. Um, uh, the first is the fact that the refugee regime that we have covers only a small portion of those who need protection. Um, that is that there are large numbers of people left out of the regime. I'll say more about that in a moment. And secondly, about a lack of accountability in the regime where people who cause displacement are never held accountable uh, for what they do. And I want to get to the point of arguing how, in a sort of uh, maybe counterintuitive way, thinking about climate migration may open up these, um, <coughs> these issues. So first, as to the left out, um, Mario mentioned 110 million displaced uh, people by violence uh, around the world, but 62 million are internally displaced uh, people. And these are obviously not included in the refugee definition, which requires a cross-border movement. And add to that, then, uh, tens of millions of people uh, uh, displaced because of environmental causes, climate change, and those numbers, as we all know, are, are going to go uh, up dramatically. And then there are these in-between kind of categories, six million Venezuelans now outside their, their country of origin, maybe refugees, maybe not, but, but all these groups, IDPs, Venezuelans, the environmentally displaced, we recognize need protection. They need assistance, they need rights, they need a haven in a heartless world, if I can put it uh, that way. Um, we do this informally. We have uh, ways of responding to emergencies. Uh, the Nansen Initiative talked about some cross-border norms that might uh, benefit people who flee disasters, the guiding principles on IDPs, non-binding but increasingly uh, gaining some kind of uh, gravitas. And there are domestic protections for people in the US laws, you all know, temporary protected status and subsidiary protection uh, in the EU. So there. There are ways we get to these groups of people, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Uh, but there's no convention, generally, for displaced people. Uh, there's no agency. Uh, there are no global institutions. And in fact, in this world, being a refugee is a favored category, right? Because you do have an agency and a set of norms, a set of binding international norms, many of which are embraced then uh, in domestic law. <coughs> because of this, the usual strategy of lawyers and advocates is to try to bring people into the refugee world. Say, well, these people are a lot like refugees. Let's call them um, uh, refugees. Um, and, and some of this has worked. I mean, we've certainly moved to the situation now where all people fleeing civil wars are generally treated as refugees. All the Syrians who left Syria went to Lebanon and Jordan and Turkey and elsewhere. No one had a problem calling them refugees, even if they weren't able to demonstrate in a strict sort of global north hearing that they had a fear of persecution based on one of the five grounds. But we've seen some novel social group claims that protect, or not novel, but evolutive social group change uh, claims that protect on the basis of gender now, and LGBTQ claims and other kinds of claims. Um, so there's been some ways in which the advocates, lawyers, have been, been helpful to expand the definition. And now we see uh, arguments for amending the convention or introducing uh, a new protocol that would deal with so-called climate refugees, people forced from their homes because of climatic <coughs> events. But rather than try to put these people into the current system, I want to argue here really a pretty radical redefinition um, of our uh, protection system, and one that moves away from sort of the core ideas of the current regime, which is that you need to have crossed a border 
and that the central aim is to prevent return to a place where you'll be persecuted on one of these five grounds with which um, uh, we, are, uh, we are all familiar with. Um, uh, if we want to build uh, an encompassing protection paradigm, uh, I want to suggest focusing not on fear of return, but rather on the fact of displacement itself. To consider a, perhaps as a fundamental norm, not legally binding yet, but perhaps we can grow it, uh, not about non refoulement, but rather perhaps about a right not to be displaced. Um, he, the idea here is that the underlying harm that refugees feel, the experience, loss of home, loss of communities, risks to health and safety, lack of education, all the things that, that someone displaced from their home uh, experience that we're so familiar with uh, and so much want to help remedy, these underlying harms are visited upon many, many other displaced people who fall outside the system. So why do we have a set of norms that lock off um, from protection um, those other groups? And I want to try to push this uh, system out to be able to embrace the claims of IDPs, cross-border climate fleers, uh, and the like. What would it mean to talk about this new kind of paradigm, paradigm based on the fact of displacement uh, rather than fear of persecution? Well, first, it would not require a, a showing of persecution. It would simply require a showing of forcibly displacement, someone forced in their home that they did not uh, want to leave. Nor would it then do would you have to go on and demonstrate that the, the reason you were fled or feared the persecution was on a kind of one of the famous five grounds of uh, race, religion, um, nationality, political opinion, membership in a social uh, group. Nor would you have to show that you uh, uh, had crossed an international border in order to gain international protection or any kind of protection. It's a simple fact of being forced from, forcibly moved uh, from your home, which would be the underlying harm that we then need to remedy. And thirdly, it would allow us to bring in the idea of accountability in a more robust way, and I'll, I'm gonna save that uh, for a little uh, while um, to talk about. This may sound like a, dra a dramatic uh, expansion of the system, and in some ways it is, but it's not a, it's not a novel idea in the sense that it's already located in some of our, our core instruments that we're familiar with. So if you look at the, uh, the guiding principles for internally displaced people, it's, uh, an IDP is defined simply as someone who has been forced or obliged to flee or leave their home. There's no reason why you fled, no requirement of persecution if you fear return. And then there's another principle, principle six of the IDPG uh, guiding principles. It says, every human being shall have the right to be protected against being arbitrarily displaced from his or her home. Now again, this is not binding law, but, it, but this is written, what, how many years after, Beth, how many years after the uh, convention? Okay, it's 30, 40 years after the convention. We'd move to a, a sense that maybe we don't have to show these kinds of grounds for persecution, but it's the fact of being arbitrarily uh, displaced um, that's crucial. So this is picked up in the Kampala Convention. I can point to other documents as well. We see a hints of it in the, the Global Compact on Migration. Um, and the like. <clears throat> so I think there's already a germ for this to grow into a sense of displacement being the key to analysis here. Um, how do we get to this new approach? We seem so wedded to the refugee definition, fear of return to persecution, and the like. And I guess the novel claim I want to make here is that um, I think the climate crisis is going to force us to do this, or at least provides an opening for this um, to happen. We, we all know we have to build a protection system for people forced from their home because of rising seas, desertification, heat, fires, floods. We, we know that has to be put in place at some point, regionally or internationally. We need norms, we need institutions, and we know we don't, we don't currently have them. And, but this puts really enormous pressure on the refugee concept because it's hard to fit climate folks into, climate displaced people into the refugee definition. This is all common knowledge to you. It's very hard to show the kind of persecution you have to show. We know that most people displaced because of climate are going to be internally displaced. They haven't crossed the border, so they're going to be not included in the system. But we will have to, therefore, if we're going to think about providing protection seriously to people forced from their homes because of environmental events and the effects of climate change, we're going to have to get a broader uh, definition uh, of who uh, is entitled um, to protection. I think another way that the climate discussion, the climate arena will bring in new ways of thinking about uh, protection is through um, 
the way this is normally addressed in the climate world is that the, the goals of the system are to avert, minimize, and address. What I mean by that is to uh, avert climate change altogether, and that's normally done in terms of mitigation, reducing CO2 uh, emissions. And then through minimizing the effects of climate change, and that can happen either through adaptation measures at home that help people stay home, not be displaced, uh, or a system if they, uh, if they are forced to move. And then addressing the effects of climate change means remedies for people who've been harmed uh, by the climate, uh, uh, climate crisis. Um, these are all ways to think about how we would help forcibly displaced people in the, in, the climate, uh, uh, in the climate arena as well, people who are forced to move because of, uh, uh, because of climate change. We want to avert the, the movement, we want to minimize the impact, and we want to come up with remedies for people who have been forced to move. We can bring this kind of language, these kind of concepts, into our forced migration um, thinking, and they can become powerful tools for providing attention. And they support this idea of helping people stay home, which is what most people want to do. Most people don't want to be displaced, who are displaced. They're forcibly and voluntarily uh, displaced. And, and there's a lot of talk in the climate world about these adaptation measures that can help people stay home, not have to move. And this is a very different focus than the refugee world, right, which already starts with someone outside their country and then asks what, uh, what, should, what should happen once they're found in, in another country. You know, this point about addressing um, the, the impact of climate change, and particularly for people who've been forced to flee, really gets to one of remedies and rights. It's a very strange world if you think about our refugee system, that the, the convention talks about the rights that people have in the hosting state, right? It talks about a right, you know all these rights, and the, between Article 1 and Article 33, all these other, other rights that are listed, a right to education, the protection of labor laws, and uh, practice religion, et cetera, et cetera. But these are rights you hold against the state that rescued you. Right? You don't hold any rights against those who forced you from your home. And there's no accountability in the system to go after those folks who forced it. People occasionally have talked about, could you do a lawsuit against a dictator who forced people out? But, but none of these actions happen. And it's nothing we as refugee lawyers and advocates really concern ourselves with. We want people, we want to protect them once they have fled. What climate does is it puts accountability on the agenda in a very serious way. Because we are now talking about those who have caused the harm. Right? We're talking about what obligations, mainly the global north developed states have to the people who were being harmed in the climate crisis because of years uh, of, uh, of, uh, of carbon emissions. So climate, the climate focus on displacement raises issues of justice to me in a way that the refugee world doesn't get there. We, yes, we talk about rights. It's very important for people to be protected, be put back on their feet to be able to join, rejoin a community. But justice rarely comes into the refugee debate, and yet it's front and center. It's core uh, to the climate debate. It demands a remedy against those who have caused the harm. And it does so for, I mean, in two very powerful ways. First, it points out that the people causing the harm are not the people who suffer the harm, right? You have the developed world imposing costs on, uh, largely on uh, the global south. And there's also an aspect of racial justice here as well, because we know it's largely, uh, it's largely uh, people of color who will feel the impacts of, uh, of climate change. So, so there are two threads in the climate justice uh, movement that become very powerful. These have now begun to be cashed out, pun intended, uh, in terms of, uh, of um, uh, thinking about uh, the phrase in the climate world is loss and damage. There's been a demand by by affected countries, countries most affected by climate change, that, the, that the, the global north, the states that have caused the pollution, pay, pay reparations, pay for the remedies, pay for the harm that's been imposed. And in the climate world, this has been located under the heading of loss and damage. And just last year at the most recent COP, there was finally uh, some kind of an agreement to start thinking about loss and damage, something the United States has never wanted to get into because of the fear of the billions, trillions of dollars the U.S. and other polluters would probably owe if we really tried to compensate people for the harm uh, that's been imposed. So how, how loss and damage gets worked out in these next set years of negotiations is only forward-looking, who has to pay, how much is paid, that, that all is going to have to get worked out, uh, out. But that's now on the agenda where 
um, where we recognize uh, the polluter should pay idea uh, in the climate world, and that is not existing in uh, the refugee world, that those who cause the harm should be those uh, who are charged with uh, remedying it. So I've been really, I've been very quick here, and I'll be, I'm just going to sum up now, but it's, um, I realize I've, it's been very sketchy because of the time limited here, and I'm happy to talk more, uh, more about these. But my claim here is that not only does the climate perspective prov provide a reconceptualization of the protection system by bringing in those left out who we know need protection, should be brought in, the climate, climate crisis will force us to, to deal with that. Um, but it will also advance and improve, it seems to me, the current refugee system by way, bringing in these uh, norms um, of accountability. So my argument is if we can bring climate migration, forced uh, migration uh, due to climate change, uh, it, it, we can help launch a paradigm shift in uh, the refugee protection um, system, which will include a, three things, a broader sense of who we protect by focusing on displacement, the fact of displacement, the right not to be displaced, not just the right not to be returned, um, on the obligations of the international community to avert, minimize, and address, and thirdly, to create remedies beyond non refoulement uh, for those who have been harmed by displacement. I'll stop there. Thank you. And happy to take questions virtually or in the crowd. Please, hey, how are you, Ellen? <clears throat> you usually step up to disagree with me, so let's see what happens this time. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ellen Aresa from Human Rights First. Um, Alex, really interested to hear your comments and totally agree on the need for accountability uh, for forced displacement and that so much more can be done uh, to build, um, build protection for people who are, and protection systems for people who are forcibly displaced. So, so interested in all of that. Curious though, I mean, from like, as a refugee lawyer, as you can imagine, what we see often is, is a different trend um, rather than an expansion of refugee protection. <laughs> We see efforts constantly, because it's an area where there is protection, we see constant efforts to say that people who truly are refugees are not refugees. Um, so I guess my question for you is, in part of your talk, it sounded as though you were saying this, these new norms and these new systems should be in place of the protection of refugees, or rather than, and I may have misunderstood that. So if you can talk a little bit more about you know, are we talking about building from the strength of what we have and, you know, improving and expanding and addressing the needs of additional populations and their rights deprivations, um, or you're talking about replacement and rejection? No, not, 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 certainly not rejection. So replacement to some extent, because I'm arguing that the, the basic conceptualization of our system of protection should change, that it should focus not on uh, protection against return, but on protection against displacement, which refugees fit into. I mean, refugees are the core part of that. So we're expanding beyond refugees, but we're not taking the core concepts of the refugee system and trying to apply them to other people. We're actually adopting a new way of thinking about displacement that would embrace what, uh, what ref uh, the refugee protection system. And also, look, I don't think everyone who's displaced would get the I'm not sure one institution could take care of everybody or the same rights, the same kinds of programs. People who were displaced by big storms may be able to go back, you know, in a, in a week or two or six months and rebuild their lives in a way. Or we may be able to adopt adaptation measures that help people be more resilient when there are big storms or the sea level rises and the like in a way that we're not going to be able to do in many conflicts around the world. So they're going to be different this will get, you know, this will get worked out in different ways for different groups. But what I'm suggesting is if you start with the fact of displacement as the, the key wrong that you want to protect against, it embraces refugees as well as these other groups. Now, I should say, it has to be paired also with the right to flee, um, as well as the right not to be displaced. Because, in fact, it, there's a lot of thinking um, that the, 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 the central people, the people who will be most hurt by climate change, are not the folks who are forced to flee, but the folks who can't flee, who don't have the resources to flee. And there's some 
um, there's some modeling that's gone on that, that shows, in fact, that the, the movement from south to north that everybody fears with climate, the climate crisis uh, is likely to be less because people will lack the means to be able to move because of the impacts of climate change. So I, I mean, I, so I think there is clearly a climate crisis. We're all, well, everyone in this room contributes to it, and we're all the beneficiaries of the system that have that's created the crisis. Let's be honest about that. In the way we live in this in this world, uh, there's a clear crisis. But I don't think there's a necessarily a migration crisis or a displacement crisis. I think the numbers, which are big, nonetheless can be handled through thinking, through norms, through institution building, uh, and the like, if we start to start to address them. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. He always gets me to think outside the box. Um, so as you were talking, it kind of brought to mind um, Pope Francis in his teachings on migration talks about the right to remain, and it's kind of the right not to be displaced. And so it is something that's in the, you know, in the air. Mm -hmm. And I agree that um, it would be interesting to start thinking more about displacement than about non reforma I wonder what has to happen in order for this idea that you have to actually, you know, take place. Like, what are the systems changes that have to take place in order for us to get from where we are today to where you envision us. Yeah. First of, all, first of all, I should say I'm often confused with Pope Francis. That happens to me regularly. <laughs> uh, but, um, um, you know, I don't have great answers on that, Michelle. I'm, I'm at the beginning here. I mean, I want to I want to get the, I'd like us to think about the change in conceptualization, change in discourse, and see where it leads. I think we have to do this for climate. We have to build these institutions. Uh, for, for climate, uh, folks who are forced in their homes because of climate. So, so it maybe can come through building those institutions. But, um, and I've got ideas. Susan Martin and I, may probably listening online, uh, have written a, a piece on uh, what a, a global platform on climate migration would look like and how you can bring different groups together. Right now, we have uh, climate is dealt with in 12 different places in the international world, even climate migration is. Uh, and could you put together kind of a uh, a, a group of uh, states and organizations willing to think about norms and institutions. So, I mean, I have some ideas about that. The hard thing, of course, is any argument, uh, as Eleanor will say, that to expand the definition, you know, or just expand the range of those protected, uh, is going to face political opposition, and we've got to work on it. So we've got to call Greta and ask her opinion on <laughs> how to do this, get the kids in the street to... Uh, to push it, but I think it, uh, what I'm trying to say is this is going to come anyway. You know, the water is going to rise, uh, and the, the metaphorical water is going to rise here. We're going to have to deal with these 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 numbers. So this is just a way to. I think I think people can ease into this idea in a way. People find it sort of say, okay, now we don't need to torture the refugee convention or adopt a new pro. We can we've got a, a new way of thinking that just fits. That stuff fits into, and now we can take it forward. But um. I'm not a political activist on how to actually make it happen, but there are a lot of those folks in this room who probably have some good ideas. Alex, speaking of Susan, she has a question for you uh, on mine. <clears throat> Hi, Susan. Alex, how would you reform the global institutions that protect and assist refugees to accommodate all displaced persons? Well, that looks like a setup since I just mentioned our article, Susan, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, we do, it, it's, this is an article published a couple of years ago, and um, uh, we, um, we identify several different models for this. You know, could you give it all to one agency? Could you give it to IOM, UNHCR, and we have reasons why we, we doubt that would work. Could you simply have a coordinating device like OCHA? Uh, that probably wouldn't work either. So we come up with this idea of this, uh, this uh, multi-stakeholder platform, um, which would have interested states, um, private sector, um, multilateral organizations and the like, and that would do a range of things. I, th I think we both think um, that most of this work is going to be done in the regions and, and domestically. So if one thing, we want to help people move, uh, gain access if, if in, in the situation that they're forced in their homes because of climate and they want to go across a border, we don't have any sort of regional norms really on how they should be moved or how they should be embraced. Could you put people into free movement agreements? Could you come up with a regional understanding for why that kind of movement 
um, should be accepted by states in a region, which is probably much more likely to happen than to do it um, than to do it at the global level. So we see this global platform as really facilitating action uh, at other levels. But it might um, do some work on, on norms. I mean, I, I, the norm we have to, the one place we really have to build out the refugee norm, Eleanor, here is the, the norm of non-refoulement um, has to now extend to climate, folks. And, um, and I don't think you'll get it through the Refugee Convention, but we're building it now through human rights work. You probably all know the Taitiote case, which was the uh, case of uh, someone being pushed back from New Zealand to one of the sinking islands, and the Human Rights Committee, which is the supervisory committee um, over the Human Rights Covenant uh, on Political and Civil Rights, um, uh, said that in a particular case, the, he, the person wouldn't win, but there may well be a human right here not to be returned where you can't live because... Uh, your country's underwater or, uh, or um, uh, because of other kind of climatic events. So there's probably an opening here in human rights law to build up that norm. That could be done at the global level. Global level could raise money. It could, it, it could do best practices, one region to another. So lots of things. I'm, looking, I'm sorry, I'm looking at you, Michelle, but I should be looking at, at Susan on the line there uh, in answering the question um, about ways to, um, uh, to accomplish it at the global level. And, and we'll see. I mean, you know... You know, uh, Susan and I have talked to some of the relevant parties here about this, and surprisingly, you talk to IOM or UNHCR, you know, IOM says, wait, this is ours. We don't want to share this with anybody, right? Or, or this so it's going to have to probably come through um, states thinking we ought to get together and try to put this thing, put this thing together. We'll, we'll see if we can sell the idea. We have one more question from Lori Hunter at the University of Colorado. Lori, go ahead. I am so excited to hear this talk, and it lays a foundation for my presentation in the next panel, which is on climate migration. But I wondered if you have any thoughts on one of the other challenges in creating this platform or category is the attribution of climate. So how do we know that it is, in fact, climate, let's say, that is the um, push factor in any particular case for migration? When does migration become forced? as a result of climate. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I, think, I think my analysis avoids that. It doesn't ask, make us ask that question. I mean, I would look simply at the fact of displacement. I mean, you'd have to show you were forcibly displaced. The, the, I mean, the test that uh, I've come up with in other work uh, is, you know, would the reasonable people think it, the person think it's just intolerable to continue living where they're living? And that's usually for a combination of reasons. It can be climate, it, it can be economics, it can be uh, gangs in the air, it can be a whole range of things. But the idea of moving to a, a displacement paradigm means that um, you would simply look at whether or not we think the person was forcibly displaced. And that's still going to be difficult between voluntary, involuntary, what about a bad economic system? When does that lead to, you know, so there's still issues. But I wouldn't, it wouldn't require us to sort out who moved because of climate or not. And in fact, that's very diff difficult. The surveys of people that people take, of the researchers take, of people who've moved apparently what look like to us for climate reasons, they never mention climate. They say, you know, crops didn't grow or the, or the herd died or whatever. And um, so, but, but a displacement, uh, it would expand to cover people who moved because of climate, but wouldn't require a finding that that was the reason. So it's not displacement based on race, religion, nationality, and climate. We wouldn't have that kind of convention. So thank you.